welcome to Definitely Not Funny. Actually, the least funny person I know. <laughs> okay, well, hi, Sam. Hello, Jackie. Welcome to Definitely Not Funny. Very excited to have you. I'm formally starting the interview right oh, now. Oh, wow. Okay. Welcome. 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 <laughs> Anyone listening or watching, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. It's lovely to have you. So I, if you want to give like a little overview of kind of what you do now, yeah. just so people can get a feel, because you have a unique career, I would say. Yeah. I When pe when people ask what I do, my, my go-to answer for the last like year has been, I make videos on the internet. Okay. Um, because it like it feels like that is the quickest one sentence describer of what I do. And I hate like the term like influencer or creator or whatever. Yeah. I, I I don't mind creator as much, but I feel like there there's there, there there's a couple of things that I'm doing right now. So um I have a, a entrepreneurship podcast, entrepreneurial podcast called Finding Founders, where I interview uh uh, it started with founders like of like tech companies around LA, but then it quickly devolved into like interviewing the founders of like nudist communities and like the founders of the <laughs> LSD movement, um, <laughs> like the guys that. that were like making LSD in their their basement in the '60s. Or then like we inter did an interview of a series on drug dealers, and so like talked to this one dude who was like trafficking like a hundred million dollars of cocaine across the U.S. Mexico border. Was he like in jail? Uh, yeah, he went to jail and then using all the logistics that he <laughs> learned on the, the drug side of things, he created his own trucking business. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was super sick to be able to, uh, talk to all those different kinds of people, um, and then build a team around it. So we built a team of like around 20 and then, um, ended up doing some stuff for Wondery, um, from that, uh, with a show called secret sauce. Um, and then. From that show, Secret Sauce, uh, I met my, well, I brought on a friend, John Fry, uh, who became my co-host on Secret Sauce. And we did four seasons of that show. And then they canceled it, the bastards. Rude. I know. How dare they? Um, the, the show honestly wasn't working in a lot of ways, but I felt like my dynamic between John and I was working. And yeah. so I'm like, yo, yeah, like, let's just like create our own show. Um, and so we started just thinking of like show ideas. And then eventually we, I was doing a cohort based course on like how to grow your podcast with LinkedIn. And one of the people who was in it was making like Reddit based content, but he wasn't showing his face. I'm like, John, what if we like just did a two person, you know, co-hosted show kind of like comedy, kind of like life advice. Um, and so we filmed the episode of it put it on TikTok and YouTube and the podcast. And the first episode got like half a million views. Jesus. Uh, and so then we we're off to the races with that. Um, and that took off. I still doing that today. Still doing Finding Founders. And then the third one is 100 New Friends, which I did with this company, Jubilee, that does like empathy-driven content. I'm actually wearing their merch I right like now. Um, and that started like last year and we, uh, basically go around and ask people if they want to be friends and then throw parties for them. We started at UCLA. Uh, then we did it in New York, um, uh, in like the smallest apartment that we could find. We like got like 60 random strangers to come in and into oh, this random New York God. apartment. Uh, we did one at a Trump rally. Uh, I'm, I'm like a liberal. And so I'm like, I'm going to try to make a hundred <laughs> friends at a, as a liberal. Um, and that was in Memphis, Tennessee, which is the, uh, the like murder capital of the U S or like, Love. it has like the most like gun deaths. Oh. Um, and then, uh, and then the most recent one was in Provo, Utah, uh, with Mormons, which was so fun. Mormons are a great time. Um, so yeah, that's like the gamut of the things that, that I'm up to a lot of content stuff. Yeah. A lot of internet video stuff. Very cool. So during, when you were younger, mm. what did you want to be when you grew up? Hmm. When I was younger. Like when you were like, yeah. I don't know, in high school, like, did you ever think you'd be doing this? Um, maybe like a little bit. So like when I was, so I actually, uh, 
grew up in kind of like an Amish house. Like it, well, I wasn't actually Amish, but my parents did not allow me to watch any television. I was about to say, were you like a house that had no yeah, TV? Yeah, no, and stuff no like TV. That? Yeah. To the point where like, <laughs> like, uh, it made me super weird because I didn't get any of the references that my peers like, would make. <laughs> they were like, what's SpongeBob? Or like, you know, like what's Super Smash Brothers? And I was like bad at all the video games and I didn't know the references to the point where one of my teachers had a parent teacher conference with my parents and were like, Hey, like, I think Sam is like falling behind socially because he doesn't get any of the oh references. Like maybe you should give him a TV. And also to the point where my friends were like, like, Oh, like, yeah, I'm, I made friends with like the super poor kid. He doesn't have a TV. <laughs> and it's like, we grew up middle class, but, uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, uh, it, it definitely made me a little weird. And so, um, because I couldn't watch TV myself, I started to just make my own videos. Um, uh, and like so what age? around like maybe like 10, like 10 to wow. 12. Did you have siblings? Yeah. I had a younger sister. Um, and I so have, she, she, oh, she was in every video. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> she, she, she's an actor now. That's so um, funny. You're like, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gave me a career. Uh, but yeah, she would like act in all, all the videos and we would post them on YouTube. And, and this was like early, early days of YouTube when it was like first iteration. Um, I remember all like the OG YouTubers were like starting at that time. And, and your was, parents were fine with that. My parents were fine with that. My, and, and funnily enough, my dad is in the like, like film and television industry. Like he makes like movies and, for a living. And he would have let you watch them. And he would have let you watch TV. Was, That's so, was that like, so confusing? Yes. Yeah. It was yeah. super confusing. It was super confusing. My parents are both super strict and so, and they were strict on different things. And so between both of them, I like, like I basically couldn't do anything, but I could make videos online. And so I would, uh, I would just like, I, I got like a, a little flip video camera. Yeah. Remember, like, I remember those. Flip you out. Can take them underwater. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so I started, uh, I started filming on that with like, uh, my sister and like friends from school. And like, every time someone like would come over, we were like, okay, like, let's film a video. And we'd film a little video together. Um, uh, and then we would, uh, edit it. And I remember I, like, I started learning how to edit uh, from YouTube too. Like YouTube yeah. was not only the distribution platform, but it was like the place that I was educating myself. And like it, I think like at that age, I started learning, like, this is how you can learn anything. Like the internet is this place where like, if you have a, an idea in your head and you want to make it into reality, you can, yeah. um, through the internet, like you can, like, you can learn any, like any skill you want and then distribute it and have people watch it. And so it was like this really, cool understanding of like, I could, I could gain knowledge in this way. And then I could also like be creative in this way. Um, and so, yeah, like I, that was like my first experimentation into, into creating videos online. And so, yeah, I, like, I guess like a little bit of me, like, Oh, like maybe this could, I didn't know if it could be a career, but I'm like, I like doing this. Yeah. yeah. When you were in high school, so what did you study in college? Uh, mechanical engineering. Okay. So, <laughs> so when you were in high school, were you like, okay, I'm going to be an engineer. Maybe I'll do these video things on the side, but yeah. I want to do engineering. I mean, the, the videos kind of went to the side. Like I, yeah. I mean, I, I was, I had a web comic in, in middle school and high school too, that I was doing called hobojocomics.com. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I, w I was working on that, but like in high school, like I got into swimming I don't, I, I wasn't really pursuing that creative stuff as much. I, I, I was much more interested in like the sciences at that point and like programming and, yeah. and I started making like websites and I made a, one of my websites, I made, I made dumptrumpnow.com, <laughs> um, which got hacked by the Russian Did government. You? Oh like my it God. literally, well not in Russian, but it got hacked by someone in Russia yeah, yeah, yeah. and it completely shut down the site and I got banned from my AdSense account. It was so annoying. Um, but, uh. Just yeah. Tell the people in Memphis about Dump Yeah, Trump. I do. No, no, they would, <laughs> they would crucify me, bro. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I was experimenting with a little bit of it, but again, I went, I went more towards the sciences and my, my parents were like pushing me towards that too. They're like, yeah, oh, engineering, that's a nice stable career. Like that's a good thing for that's our good, son to do. Good thing for my son. And yeah, yes. yeah. So they, they were definitely pushing me towards that. So I didn't like, I, I was going more towards the sciences in high school. Okay. And so then you get to college, you're studying mechanical engineering yes, and you started finding founders. Yeah. So, well, I, so 
when I started UCLA, I was aerospace because I wanted to make rockets. And cool. I'm like, that will be fun. And my dad like took me to like SpaceX, like on a little, little Wait, father cute. son uh, field trip. And I'm like, rockets, this is so sick. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna like put people on the moon and shit. And then like, I had a really good senior year computer science teacher and I was like enthralled, right? So then I get to UCLA and I realized that engineering at UCLA is the most boring and <laughs> terrible program ever, dude. It was, it sucked. <laughs> it sucked so much. It was, it were, they were my least favorite classes. Um, and also like, I was just not good at it, uh, yeah. uh, uh because I was, wasn't interested. And, um, and so I, I joined this entrepreneurship fraternity on campus and, um, that kind of like changed my trajectory a lot where yeah. all the people in it were like starting businesses and like creating just things. And I'm like, that's so sick. Like I want to create things too. And so I would just like do these like, like mini business ideas on the side, but nothing really came to fruition. Yeah. Um, until I think it was like the junior year or senior year, maybe no beginning of senior year. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do still. And I, but I knew I didn't want to do engineering. Engineering just seemed so freaking boring. Um, but I, and, and I had totally tuned out of all my classes and yeah. I was just like, I was just like taking tests, but not going to any classes. Yeah. And so I, I was like, how can I, how can I just learn? How can I find a business idea that I just like want to do? Like, and, and like, how can I learn what like entrepreneurship looks like, at least to my friends? And so I just started interviewing my friends around campus and like, who had like businesses and like, and like interviewing them being like you were doing like an informational interview or interviewing them like formally, like in a formally podcast. for the podcast. Like I started yes. this podcast and I'm like, like I said, I just called it finding founders and I just started interviewing my friends and I'm like, oh, this is kind of fun. I like, yeah. really like doing this. And I want to take it seriously. And I was inspired by like, uh, like, like Guy Raz, how I built this. Um, well, was listening this morning. Yeah, right. huge. And then like startup, um, you know, like Gimlet podcast yeah. about like a podcast about starting a podcast company, which was so Very sick. meta. <laughs> yeah, super meta. I, I just like wanted to to learn what it was like to be, to like to do entrepreneurship. So I started interviewing all, all, all my friends. And, um, and then I'm like, I kind of want to up the ante a little bit. And so from interviewing my friends, I'm like, who's like the most interesting person I could try to get in touch with. And I was listening to the second season of startup, um, with a friend in her dorm. And there was a line in the second season. It's like about the founder of American apparel. It's guy yeah. named Dove Charney. Um, he's like pretty, uh, uh, some would say he was like a, a, a problematic character. Yes. Um, and, but in the first half of the season, they're just being like, this guy is like crazy, but like insane in like a cool, like startup -y way. And there was this throwaway line where it was like, um, this guy always answers his phone. And I'm like, there's no way he always answers his phone. And I'm like, hey, let's pause this really quick. So we pause it. And, uh, and I, I look up his number online. I find it. I call it and it's ringing and ringing, ringing. And then he goes like, hello. And no I'm like, way. is this Dove? And he's like, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I, and I was, I, oh God, I, if you're so angry, why are you answering your phone? <laughs> dude, I, I, I had, I had no idea. Like what does, I, I wasn't prepared for him to answer. I'm like, um, uh, can I have like an internship? And like, uh, can I interview for my podcast? He's like, uh, yeah, just like, uh, come to the factory. And so, my like second or third interview for finding founders was the founder of American apparel, which like was like wow. this half billion dollar company, insane interview. But after that I could interview anyone I wanted. Yeah. Cause I had credibility now. Yeah. Wow. How did you promote your show? I didn't really. Um, I, I just like, I just, my, my thought process was like, I just want to make it so, better than anything else out there. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I don't have any credibility besides like maybe interviewing some, some cool people. Um, but how can I add another layer? And so my, my thing was like, I'm going to make this the best produced podcast like ever. 
I'm going to yeah. like, I'm going to, I want to rival the production value of like a, how I built this yeah. or of a gimlet. Um, and I had, I had been editing like since I was 12. And so I knew my way yeah. around like premiere and stuff. And so I started, uh, editing stuff and I would put music and sound effects and voiceover and I would do this whole process, but it took forever to do for like a two hour interview to do all that alone. Yeah. It was really, really difficult and time consuming. And yeah. so I started like, just like going around campus and be like, yo, do you want to like be part of a podcast? Um, and I built up a team and like, first it was just one person that was helping me edit and we would record like ads in like my, my like our, my closet. How'd you get ads? Just like. And, uh, initially anchor, if you host on anchor, okay, yeah. you like, like by promoting the site, you, by promoting the podcast platform, you get money for every thousand views that you get. Amazing. And so we were just recording ads in there. Um, and then just joke ads, like subscribe to finding founders and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was me and this guy, Ronald, and we, we started like building it from the ground up. He was kind of like, I was kind of like mentoring him and he would be learning the editing process and the outreach process. And then like one person turned to two people, two people turned to four, four turned to eight, eight turned to 16. And before I knew it, I had like 30 people working on this project. Oh my God. And it was like, I had like a whole outreach and research team. I had a whole design team. I had a whole editing team. We were building out like systems and processes and to the point where like, it was like a full fledged like studio and everyone was working on it for free. I wasn't I was really, about to say, was it? Any, yeah. I wasn't making any money for it. Like I, yeah. I, it was just, it was all, it was all like people just like, Oh, this is like sick. Like this is cool to work on. And it, I, but like before I knew it, 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 there was this big team. We're having these huge team meetings and like, we were like meeting in, uh, like random buildings around campus. And wow. I'm like, okay. Like, I guess this is turning into something. Um, and then we interviewed this guy, Kong fam, who created this company, Jump Cut. Okay. Um, and uh, went into the interview um, at this like swanky little office in uh, Hollywood. And it was, it, it, it was a great interview. We go back, we, we, we do our editing. It takes like a, like maybe like we, we had like this, um, production process where it was like an eight week production process and it would go through each unit of our team, like in this assembly line fashion. Wow. And so at any one time we were working on eight episodes. So we were released weekly, but it was like two month lead time from doing the interview. And were you to, managing all of this? Yeah. Yeah. So I okay. was like managing the team and everything. And, and you would do the interviews. Yeah. I would do the interviews and then manage the team, but there was a team lead for each department. So there's a team lead for <laughs> editing. And yeah. It was like, it was like a full this operation. Yeah. Yeah. No um, way. and so then, uh, I interviewed this guy Kong two months later, I'm like, Hey, we finished the interview. Um, and I sent it over to him. And this is like now like getting to the end of my senior year, I'm applying for engineering jobs, but the jobs are just so freaking boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like one of the jobs that I was interviewing for was a quality assurance manager at some like big engineering firm. And essentially the job was going to different factories and if the equipment wasn't up to date or up to code, I would give people tickets. And oh, so I would just be in a complete, like a completely hated per And like, yeah. obviously there would be more, probably other opportunities, but like it, that was just, it just seemed. You'd be the guy terrible. who like everyone would groan if he was yes, coming into the factory. Exactly. Yes. And I'm like, that just sounds like a nightmare. No. Yeah. Um, and so I'd stayed in touch with that guy Kong that I interviewed and I kind of like what was cool about this, this process is I was like, uh, getting to know some pretty high profile people. Yeah. Um, and he calls me and he's like, Hey, I just listened to the episode. I had no idea it was going to be like this. I'm like, what, what do you mean? He's like, this is like the best produced thing that I've, I've heard. Oh my um, God, you did it. Yeah. And so, and he was like, do you want to like run my podcast production department? at my company. And I'm like, yes, please. Yes. And so I had my job offer after school. That's uh, amazing. And too. that kind of like, cause I wasn't making money up to that point, but at that moment I realized, Oh, like I can actually make a living doing what I love. Yeah. And so that kind of like got me off to the races. Wow. Um, how long were you doing that for then working for him? Do you still work for him? No. So, um, when did you graduate? I graduated in 2019. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I started working at jump cut after graduation and it was awesome. 
um, essentially he was paying me to do what I was already doing yeah. again. And, yeah. uh, we created a show with called, your same team. No, uh, some, uh, some key members I was taking with me and paying to do it. Wow. So, um, so yeah, it was it, like, we were starting from the ground up and I was still doing finding founders while, while doing this. Yeah. Um, but, uh, what I didn't realize is he wanted me to interview entrepreneurs with this like sound design and like, in like a, how I built the style, but he wanted me to interview a specific subset of people because he thought it would be interesting. Um, and, uh, and I, <laughs> and that subset of people was porn stars. Oh <laughs> my God. And so, How'd you tell your parents? I had oh. to tell my parents. Yeah. My first job out of college is interviewing porn stars. You're like, I thought you were getting a mechanical no, engineering degree. What <laughs> happened? Our son, our boy. Our um, TV boy. Low key though. That so is, fun. I'm so sure. fun. Like, like the, the, like a lot of these, we interview like a, a lot of women in the industry. And it's like, I mean, these people are, are like, they're entrepreneurs, you know, yeah. they're, uh, uh, like, like this girl, like got her start. salt. one of the people we talked to, like, uh, got, got her start, like selling her panties and like made like a hundred grand from doing that. Jesus. And then built out like a whole texting platform where it's like a subscription service for people like, you know, that are fans of hers. And so she built out like this whole career. That's um, amazing. and it was really cool to, to interview like these people that, um, were not necessarily like viewed as business people, yeah. but, um, but not viewing them through a business lens. Yeah. And that was super eye opening. And we ended up interviewing like creators and other, other like people not like related directly to the porn industry. But, um, yeah, that, those were some of the first interviews. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. It was so fun. And were six you months nervous? Later, no, uh, yeah. When going to a porn star's apartment for the first time as like a twenty-two year old, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm always a little nervous. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, and, and she she was so nice, and and like you know, like all the all the people I interviewed were were so nice. But I didn't get it to make that many episodes because, um, literally like four weeks into this new job, it was so sick. Like I got. All of my meals paid for. It was in this amazing apartment. So many snacks. I ate so many snacks there. And it was like working on like exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and then like a month in, they we would have these all hands meetings. And they're like, hey, like the ads are not, they, they sold online courses for entrepreneurship. Okay. And they're like, these ads, you know, they're not really working. We're gonna have to change some strategies. And then like every month, it was getting worse and worse and worse. It's like, Hey, like we're really losing money here. And then like, Hey, like we're probably gonna have to do layoffs. And I was the last person hired for a department yep. that was being built from the ground up. So I was the first to go. Yeah. Um, and so six months later I was jobless and, uh, kind of back to square one. Yeah. Uh, does the company still exist? No, Yeah. it's not, it's just not. So sorry, I'm, I'm veering from my questions and I'm now just doing a deep dive into your <laughs> professional life. If that's okay with you, I'm very interested. Yeah. Um, so what'd you do? Um, so I had interviewed a bunch of creators and one of the interviews that I did was started casting couch. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> so have you heard of bang bus? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, um, I, I interviewed this guy, um, sky John, he had a, uh, a, a, a YouTube and Facebook page called the tipsy bartender. And yeah, yeah. He's like massive on socials. He's like, I think he's from like Barbados and he's like this like big, like super friendly dude. That's like mixing drinks and stuff. Fine. He's like awesome dude. Um, and, uh, I did the interview with him. I really liked him. And after I got let go, I was like, Hey, like, do you need like help making a podcast? I'm just like, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I got nothing, but maybe, maybe this, this, can, yeah. we, we can do something here. Um, it's like, actually, yeah, I've been thinking about doing a podcast for a while. I want to do a video podcast and I want to do it in this way and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, sick, like, let me, um, uh, let, let's like work together to figure out like how to do yeah. it. He ended up hiring me to do it. And we started doing this video podcast together and bro, I was getting paid more than I, I was getting paid two grand a week to do, uh, this video podcast. It was like 
double or triple what I was making before. And I was freak. I was like, holy shit. Like I, I, I got Just to do what you would already like, like to, to do and knew how to do. Exactly. Exactly. And we were like, and, and, and now in, he was inter- he was doing the interviews, but he was doing like interviews with like really like cool guests. And I was, and it was like fun being in person in the studio with him. And we we're just like building something super sick. Um, and, and like, he like, like what he loved is like doing all these interviews in person. Yeah. And so I started that in around like 2020. Oh, <laughs> And so it was, it was moving. The show was growing. It was sick. And then, and then it COVID hits. Yeah. yeah. And then COVID hits. And I'm like, Dan, and he's like, Hey, like really why I love doing it was because it was in person. Um, and that shut down too. And I'm like, fuck now I'm back to square well, one. You're like, what do I do now? Yeah. But, but you're getting these little experiences each time. Yeah. And what, what it's proving to me is like, it's not a fluke. Like yeah. I can make money doing what I love and I can, I can like, can I, I, like I'm, I'm in a good space. Like yeah. I, 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 like I, I feel like I, I didn't make a, a wrong move by giving up my engineering stuff to, yeah. to pursue content. Um, and all the while I'm still doing, um, uh, finding founders. So I'm still releasing wow. weekly. Um, and Do you still have still that going. whole team of like 30 people helping you? I've downsized it a little bit. It was, I think because like now, now we can, uh, uh, like, like now not everyone's working for free and stuff. So, exactly. And people uh, have jobs. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause like before when everyone's working for free, like people can only do like two to three hours a week. Yeah. Right. But if you have like more full-time or part-time people, you need less people. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I was still doing that. And then someone heard the podcast and it was this big studio exec, um, who had a company called Jukin Media. Okay. Um, if you've heard of like fail army or like, uh, people are awesome or yeah. like, like, like all, like all these, um, uh, like clip shows, basically they own all of those and a bunch of other shows and they license it out to, they're like one of those like, like content aggregator people that like someone has a viral video, they buy up the rights and then they resell it to different, different, um, companies. Um, Interesting. and so, uh, I, I, I interview him for finding founders. Um, he listens to the episode and again, he has that, that like, holy shit, I didn't know it was going to be this good. Yeah. He's like, I actually have a idea for, um, a 12 part documentary series about the beginnings of YouTube. Would you be interested in pursuing like, like, like creating that for me? And I'm like, hell yeah. And so he paid me to interview like the top execs of like YouTube and all these, um, multi-level market or multi, uh, uh, MCNs. Uh, what does that stand for? Uh, Ugh. multi, channel networks, um, that sounds something right. like that MCN. I'll take that. Yeah. Multi-channel networks, I believe. Um, I'm, I'm freaking blanking on the, the name, but, um, yeah. So I started interviewing all these people and creating this like crazy documentary about the That's beginnings so of cool. YouTube. It was so fun. It was so fun. Um, and it, it ended up like working really well. Um, and we, we finished it and, uh, and again, like another, another example of, Hey, like, okay, like this, this still can work. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. Okay. So I kind of want to transition now into your, so you're still doing finding founders. You're, just, you're still doing all these shows. Yeah. And then you get to this, like, I'm going to host parties in different cities where I gather a hundred strangers. Yes. How did, we, how did we get there? It kind of the same way everything else yeah. started. Um, I, had an idea for this show that I was initially calling the group chat because all right. So like during COVID, um, I felt super lonely and no, really? a lot of people did. <laughs> was yeah, it lonely? It was a little lonely. <laughs> um, were you fucking miserable? <laughs> I, what, not for long actually. Oh, I was miserable for very long. I was, <laughs> I, I, but I was miserable for a little bit and I was like, this sucks. Like, how can yeah. I make this better? Yeah. Um, and, what I realized is, and I think a lot of people realize this when they graduate from college is like community is no longer like built in. A give, yeah. It's not built in. It's yeah. not a given. Like you have to go out and create it if you want community to exist. Yeah. And so I decided that 
I needed to start making community exist. Like I couldn't, I couldn't just wait for it to come around even in a pandemic. And so I created a spreadsheet of like 250 people that I had like kind of had some level of relationship with. And it, like, it was people from like super close friends to like acquaintances that I maybe talked to yeah. once. And I said, I'm going to reach out to three of these people a day. Um, and every day reached out to three people like, Hey, how's it been? Like, how, how like, how are you? Um, and then I would escalate it from text to a phone call and then we would catch up over a phone call and then it would go from phone call to like in-person kind of distance, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I started creating like this network of like really strong relationships over phone calls, um, over like in-person meetings. And it was, it ended up being like this really strong, like a group of individual friendships. Like, how can I make this like a little bit more sticky? And I think it was really hard to keep up individual friendships, um, but it's much easier to keep up those individual friendships in a group. And so I started a group chat with like a selection of the closest, coolest people that I knew. And um, I started hanging out with them. And this was like, a, like a, 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 th a little bit later when things had opened up um, a bit more. And the, the vibe was incredible. We do everything together. We go to like the beach together together. We would throw raves in the desert together. Like we would, it, it was like this. And this, these people didn't know each other previously. No, no, no. And, and, and we practiced this like idea of like radical inclusivity. So like anyone who wanted to join this group chat, like we could, um, and they would be invited, but if they were inactive, we would remove them. So it's like, you had to like actually be involved. Participate. But yeah, yeah. Cause there's only like, cause there's a 32 limit. I, on, yeah. on a group chat. Right. Um, and it was just like this magical thing where it's like, Oh, you just have to have a group chat and participate like frequently. And you have like this network of friends that you can always hang out with. And I never really had a friend group like that in that way. Yeah. Um, and so I just like believed in the power of this group chat. And so like, I want to make a show about this, about like the idea of a group chat and like bringing strangers together into a group chat and like all of them talking to yeah. each other. Um, and like creating connection and friendship because I think like we're in like this loneliness epidemic and like people are lonelier than ever. And so how do you, can you, how can you admit, like, just like help a little bit with that? Yeah. Um, and so I was trying to look for like a partner that I think would be good. And there's this company Jubilee that does empathy driven content. That's kind of like their motto. And I had loved their videos and I'm like, I'm going to interview the founder of that company and pitch him after the, founders. yeah, I'm going to pitch him so after the interview. Smart. And so I interview him, amazing interview. They're trying to create like the Disney of empathy. And then after the interview finishes, I'm like, Hey, um, amazing talk to you. Do you have like five minutes? I just want to pitch you on this show. And so yeah. I had my slide deck ready and I pitch him on this show that I was calling the group chat and I finished the pitch and I'm like really nervous. And by show you mean like podcast. Uh, I mean like a, like a YouTube, a YouTube series. Channel. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I'm, I'm like, like, I'm kind of like nervous cause I, of course it was uh, like, I, he wasn't expecting me to pitch him on a show. Um, but, uh, I'm like, I finished and like, I'm like, so like, what do you think? And he's like silent for a little bit. And he's like, this is actually exactly what we've been looking for this year. And I'm like, hell yeah. And he's like, here, um, I want you to make these changes to it. And then I want you to pitch it to our team next week. And so I'm like, hell yeah. And so I go and go back to my apartment. I like work on it a little bit more, pitch to them again. And they're like, yes, let's do it. And so we, they, we, we were decided to do a pilot. It's just me with a, a GoPro 360 on the UCLA campus. And I just start asking people want to be friends. And I did that for three days. And I think I like, it was like really hard. Cause like asking Trying to get a hundred people to say hard. yes. Huh? I feel like asking peers is hard. Yeah. Or asking complete strangers is, yeah. is really tough. Yeah. And it also gets harder every subsequent day because the first day, like, you know, no one knows you. And so it's like, oh, like, I'm just like, you know, this, this, this random kid asking people if they want to be friends. But then on the second day, there's people that have rejected you that are still on campus that see you. And that feels fucking weird and a little dicey. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like I, I started interviewing, um, or I started just like interviewing and asking people want to be friends along those three days. And every day, uh, it, I went through this cycle of like, 
I would start off the day like excited and then get a, rejected a bunch and just be like, I can't like, why am I doing this? This is like really, really hard. Like, yeah, I, maybe I wasn't meant to do this. And then I would finish off the day with like these like crazy interactions with strangers that I'm like, oh, like, like, may, like all the social rejection is actually worth it to get to these moments. And every day was like that. And then at the end of the three days, I was, I, I had no, I, we, we, we decided to do a picnic as like the party at the end. And I was inviting everyone that I met to this picnic and I had no idea how many people would show up or if anyone would show up. But then like people started wanting to help like a girl, Angie from the second day was like, Hey, do you need help going to like, like going to the groceries or, uh, this guy like Daniel was like, Hey, like, can I bring like, you know, some of my like, like orchestra friends and, um, like, yeah, sure. And I started getting all these messages and then finally it gets to the time where everyone's supposed to show up. And there was like a hundred people there wow. all like just down to being friends and, and, and like open to this idea of like, like friendship with people that they, they didn't even know. And there was this like beautiful experience where I, I was talking to this one guy and he's like, yeah, dude, I've had like a really, really tough week. I, I, f I felt really lonely and apart from my friends since COVID. And this has kind of showed me like that, that connection that I've been so sorely missing is actually not that far away. And, Aww. and like, and that was like something that, that a bunch of people in this, that came to this, like had felt. And I'm like, this is my calling. I yeah. need to do more of this. Yeah. Um, and they loved the pilot and we kept doing it. That makes it so worth it. Yeah. It was, it was, it's the closest I felt to like that purpose. Yeah. I think. And so far in the things I've made. How, how do you approach someone? Like if you're like, okay, like I'm going to go and like meet a hundred people. Is it like people are just like walking yeah. by and you're like, hi. Do you want to be friends? I, will literally I wouldn't go, respond well to that. Yeah. A lot of people don't. A okay. lot of people don't. Yeah. Uh, but like, <laughs> but that might be a personal problem. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, I mean, it's, it's like, like uh, if you're open to it, like I would, I basically would go up to you. Like if you were walking and like, Hey, like want to be friends? And they would be like, what? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Oh, like, like, do you want to be friends? Like, what are you up to? Like, I'm, I'm like new to campus. Like, I like, what are you up to today? And is someone filming you while you do this or no? I was filming myself, but then on the other episodes, yeah, I would have a, a video. So they see like that it's, this is being filmed. Yeah. And they were like, what is this for? And then it would be like, Oh, like, you know, I'm just trying to show that like kind of what I said, I'm just trying to show that there's friendship all around us yeah. and, and yeah, you want to hang out. Um, like a lot of people are like, sure. And people like invited me into their dorms and invited oh me God. to like lunch. And it's like, like it, it seems a lot scarier, um, before you do it. But once you start doing it, it's like, you realize how many people are actually open to it. Yeah. yeah. I guess you're an approachable guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that like you, you, you have to come with a certain, you feel very non-threatening. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like if I was like a, like a six, eight, like super it would be harder. dude, it might yeah. be a little harder. Um, but I'm like a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man kind of guy. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. I think that works. So do you feel like that's a skill that the approaching and talking to strangers is a skill that you've practiced and like kind of had to hone? For sure. For sure. I mean, like, like also just like having deep conversations with people that you just met with yeah. like the podcast. I think it, it all kind of, um, it all, it all blends together. Yeah. And I think it's a skill that anyone could develop. And I think it's one of the most important skills that you can have. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, so what are you, so your career now, what's like your day to day? Like, like, what are you going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do tomorrow? Let's see. Let's see. What am I up to tomorrow? Um, tomorrow's Monday for everyone listening. Okay. I'm doing three pre-interviews for finding founders in the morning. Um, pre-interview pre is, pre -interview. I, I mean, so basically it's like, uh, cause I, I liked, we, we do research beforehand yeah. on like their life story. And then I just like, Hey, like this is the research that I have. Um, uh, what do you want to focus on in this interview? Like, yeah. um, and then also like showing them what we've done. And like, like I giving a little, cause a lot of people have like, we haven't listened to your podcast before, yeah. before they come on the show. And so it's just like, Hey, this is like a little clip. This is what we're, we're producing. Do you have any questions? And a lot of people are like, Oh shit. Like I didn't know it was going to be like that produced or, um, I, yeah. I want, I have a book coming out. I would love to talk about that. Um, or 
I, this is like a, like a little sensitive. Like I don't want to talk about this. Yeah. Um, How far so, in advance do you do those? Um, we schedule that first. And then from that, they schedule the full interview. Okay. Um, and then I have a YouTube optimization call. Um, that's, uh, for OKOP, the comedy podcast. Um, and basically it's like, how do we optimize YouTube to grow? Yeah. And so we'll look at like our CTRs. We'll look at our like average watch time. We'll look at a bunch of stuff like that. Um, then we're creating a new show. We're launching a new show this month called okay money. Um, it's our finance show. Yeah. Super excited about that. Oh my God. Um, Congrats. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be, it's you and the same guy, John. Yep. Yep. And, um, then we're doing a creator compound in Bali for a month. Um, and so we'll be prepping that basically I'm inviting a bunch of friends that don't have like, like that are like in the content space, um, for a month in Bali. And so we're flying out a few members of our team. Are you funding it? Yeah. 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 And so we're flying out a few members of our team, um, to, to come and then just like other friends and stuff. Uh, so cool. Yeah. When is that? That is in, uh, uh, August, uh, 13th to September 10th. Wow. Um, so that's that we're going to be working a little bit on that. And then let's see what else. And you work on this, you work mainly with this guy, John. Yeah. So John and we're like, basically like, uh, we're working on more and more stuff together. Like yeah. it's kind of like, oh, because OKOP is doing well. Um, it, we're like, okay, like now it's time to expand and like make the network of multiple shows. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're super What's excited. The name of the network? Right now, like the okay network. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, cause we have OKOP and then we're thinking like, okay, money and then like, okay, connection and, um, kind of, that but we we haven't completely settled yet yeah really cool have yeah. you listened to have you ever listened to t-boy the best one yet t-boy no okay i'm gonna send it to you it's like a daily financial news podcast and it's like very like digestible and mm. fun and like quick and bitey um i love it i've Do listened you listen to robin hood snacks is it like that it it is robin hood snacks oh after they left robin hood oh it's the exact same two guys okay, okay they're okay. just not signed with robin hood anymore so they needed a new name Ah, that's exactly what it is. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. I've I love their stuff. I, literally listen to them every day for four years now. They're amazing. They're oh amazing. my God. Yeah. Finance so, new, news made fun. <laughs> exactly. So good. Um, I was going to say, okay, so you're, you're doing a lot. You've always sort of seemed to do a lot. How do you balance that with like just socially and personally? Yeah. I think it like, I think it comes in waves. Okay. Right. Like you have like different phases. Yeah. Like I think like there, there was a phase where I was super investing into like my friend group. And then like the last year, I think I've been super investing into like business stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's really hard to, especially when you're young to like manage all of them at the same time. Yeah. Because like, we're still trying to like build our career. We're like trying to feel like financially secure, or at least I am like, sure. there's like, uh, 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 I feel like, especially in like building, uh, your own business, there's a lot of like ups and downs that you're like, okay, like, oh, you think you're going to be rich. And then like, you're like, oh fuck, like, uh, like, am I going to be able to pay rent? Yeah. rent? Um, and, and there's, I, I think there's like a lot of like those, those ebbs and flows. And so like sometimes, uh, that, that leads you to needing to pay attention to like the business stuff more yeah. than like like curating your friendships. And so I guess the short answer is like, I, I haven't actually learned how to balance it rather than like, just like listening to when I feel sad yeah. or unhappy and then taking action from that point. Like I think recently I felt more, I I've, I, I feel more stable in my career stuff. And then I feel like a little bit uh, destabilized in my friendships. And so, yeah, I just, but I just see it as, okay, like now I just need to treat that like a project and I need to invest in that. And so, um, to do that, you just start, you know, reaching out to friends, you start, uh, being better at responding to texts, which I was bad at for I, a while. I have like five different people who texted me at the end of March and I haven't responded yet. How, how many unread texts do you have? Let's see. 182. Oh, yeah. 426. <laughs> oh my God. That makes me feel so much better. So Thank bad. God. It's so bad. 
Oh, it's so bad. The worst is like some of the people I reached out to them. I know. I was like, let's chat. Like, I miss you. I want to catch up. Like, let's schedule a time. And then they responded. And then I was just like, ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> like, never mind. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why is it hard for you to respond to texts? Um, I think it's like, it, it, it's just all a priority thing, right? It's Completely like, you're, right. you, I, I, there's a few friends that I super prioritize. Yeah. Um, like I, I probably have like three to four people that I'm like, that I will always respond Want to. to. Yeah. Maybe like, plus like my sister, mom and dad. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then it's like, then it's like work and, and, and stuff. So it's like, I think. You can just you just choose to reprioritize it if it ever feels like you are feeling sad about it. Like I, I, I yeah. feel like your emotions are really like a, like a, it's a, it's it's gr it's great information. Like I don't I don't look at me like yesterday. I was feeling sad about like like my girlfriend's gone right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Ariana is, Where is uh, she? She's in Texas visiting family. She's gonna be back today. But like she was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She 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 left on Friday and she Ariana. <laughs> yeah. But like I, uh, uh, I spend so much of my default time with her Yeah, that when she like yesterday was Saturday and I'm like, I don't have anything. Like, what do I do? Today. Like, what am I going to do? Like, yeah. yeah. Gonna, and, and I, and it's just like moments like that. I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Like I'm a little sad because of this. That means that I need to invest in friendships that are more diversified than just my girlfriend. Yeah. Right. Because it's like, it's a lot to put on like one person. One person. Yeah. Like you need to fulfill all of my social, um, needs. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just look at like those emotions as just information. It's like, how, and how, how can I, how can I interpret that into action? I like that yeah. a lot. Have you ever like really struggled with mental health stuff? Yeah. Or more so in like middle school and early, uh, college. Yeah. Um, middle school, I was like bullied relentlessly. I was like, oh, it was awful. It I'm was so, so sorry. Bad. Yeah. Um, in middle school, I, so like I, I was like popular until like second grade and then I moved to Australia and I like had a really tough time integrating into like this new school system. The kids were all mean and they're like, this is like dumb American. That's yeah. Over here. Yeah. Like, Ew. And then I came back to. America and then it was like the weird Australian kid and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was it was like like I had spent so much time like you know like learning the lingo and like the like the accent and stuff and then uh I get like right back to America and then I'm, I'm now I'm like different again and there was and I think it didn't help like being raised in a unique way either yeah and so I was just like very obviously just like not on the same page as everyone and I think that led to a lot of oh and I didn't want to be and yeah. that, that makes you a pretty big target where yes. it's like, like I didn't want to assimilate and, but then I wanted like that freedom of expression and like the tallest poppy kind of gets like cut down when you're, yes. when you're younger. And so like, I'm super depressed, like all of middle school, I hated going to school. And oh. I, but like, I guess like, uh, why'd I, you keep going? Uh, I mean, I, I had a great family and, yeah. um, and like, I just like had the, I had to make creative out, outlets. Like that's probably one of the reasons that I made videos. Is like yeah. I could be this different person on the internet. Um, and, and yeah, and things got a little bit better in high school, but I think like I had like a, like a classic, like guys friend group where it was like super like shitting on each other. Yes. And I felt like I was shat on most. And so it was like, uh, it was, it was just really, it, it felt, um, it felt really, it just, it didn't feel constructive. It was like, you were doing something that was a reach. Let's, let's shit on you for that. Yes. Right? Like anything creative shat on. Yeah. Like nothing, anything different is, is a, is a reason, uh, for them to cut you down. And then in college, like I finally started finding people that like, actually supported my creative like like creative desires yeah. and urges and like were weird in the same ways that I was but like I actually thought that was cool and like yeah. um it was it was slowly finding like a group of people that I really really uh respected and 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 I think also people who respected like different ways of moving through life um a little bit more open and so 
yeah, I think like, uh, I think it's a lot easier to find those people in college because there's just yeah. more of them around you. Yeah. Uh, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> Mental health wise? Yeah. Yeah. All over the place. So I've talked about this on my show, but I actually have struggled with like OCD since I was nine. Mm. Um, and it was really bad, like in middle school. And then I started how did it materialize? medication. It, well, so usually OCD comes from like, I mean, it's something that like, it's like innate brain wiring mm -hmm. um, and it's biological, but then it presents itself when people are found, like have sort of newfound independence and mm -hmm. lose structure. So um, a lot of times it comes out when people go to college. When I was nine, my parents got divorced. And so that gave me, I had to be like my, all of my structure sort of disappeared and I had to like find new independence. And so some of my therapists have thought that like, maybe that could be correlated to why it sort of showed up then. And so it showed up then. And then and how did it show up? Like, what was, the, it was what like, you, what would you do? I was scared of everything. Mm -hmm. So I was just scared of everything. Like I was terrified that like, if I, that I was going to die in my sleep. So I would refuse to sleep because I was like, I'm, I'm going to die. Like I can't, I can't risk going to bed because I'm going to die. Um, so I wouldn't sleep, but then I could sleep during the day if I was like with my mom, because she'd be there in case I die. Like in case I was about to die in my sleep, she would notice and be able to like save me. And that was like my like thought process behind it. And I was just like very scared, very sad all the time. And just like incredibly anxious and a really bad, like panic disorders. So I'd have these really, really terrible panic attacks. Like I'd have to like breathe into paper bags and like do the whole thing, um, just to kind of like calm myself down. And it was really hard for me to go to school. I'd have to leave school all the time. Then started taking medication in like around sixth grade because I couldn't go to school at this point. I was too like scared of everything. I was scared if I got in the car, I was going to get in a car accident and then I was going to die and then like whatever. Um, and so in order to like prevent that from happening, I just wouldn't get in a car and like you wouldn't get in any cars or like I like I would but like I would like refuse for a yeah. while and so it eventually it just sort of got to the point where it was like okay like I can't do anything like I cannot function and so I started taking medication changed my life it was the most positive thing that could have possibly what happened. was the medication what did it do Prozac um starting Prozac which is an SSRI and those work really well for like anxiety disorders depressive disorders and then um for OCD at like a higher dosage it actually really helps a lot and so I started taking that and that made a big difference. And then when I got to high school, I was just like stressed. I was just like, I have to get into a good college, blah, blah, blah. And I was just sort of like running around stressed and grumpy. And, but it wasn't like any like severe OCD, like really big, like scared of things. It was more just like, whatever. I was like mad at the world. Mm -hmm. And then, and I like hated Massachusetts and I just like couldn't wait to go to California. And that was just like, Okay, we got to do that. When I got to school, it was like not too bad. I had some little things, so like very scared of alcohol. So like I was mm. like scared of losing control, so I like wouldn't drink. And if I tried to drink, I'd get really sick because I was I would have a panic attack, so I would like really? get nauseous and throw up the whole thing. Yeah, and get like dizzy and like couldn't breathe and whatever from like two sips of alcohol. Wow. Yeah, so I just didn't drink. I like pretended the whole time that I was drinking. Because otherwise people treated me weird if that, they knew I wasn't drinking. Really? Oh my God. What would they say? Uh, it was like, it, it was varied reactions. So like freshman, sophomore year was very much like, why aren't you drinking? Like, that's weird. You should drink like mm. whatever, like blah, 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 blah. Like don't be lame. A lot of that stuff. Then well, kind of by junior year, people were like, oh, like that's weird that you're not drinking. Is it like weird that I'm drunk and you're sober. And I'm like, no, it's not weird unless you keep fucking talking like that. Yeah. And then they're like, okay, well, like, I just feel like you're judging me. And I'm like, I'm not judging you. Like, mm. I don't know. And then by senior year, it was a lot of like, wow, that's so cool that you don't drink. Like, I wish I didn't drink, mm. but like, I just like love to drink. So, but like, it's really cool that you don't. Like, I really respect that. And I'm like, can we just get over it? And it's mm. annoying because what was very frustrating to me is like, whatever we were taught, like if we were talking about, let's say we're at a party and we're sitting there talking about dogs and then you're like, Oh, like, do you want to drink? Like, by the way, like, let's go grab, I need a white claw or something. And then if I said like, 
if I said like, yeah, I'll have a white claw. You'd hand me the white claw. We'd keep talking about yeah. dogs. If I say, no, actually, I like, I don't really drink. People would be like, oh, why not? Mm. Oh, it's interesting. Now we're no longer talking about dogs. We're just talking about my not drinking. Mm. So it just gets fucking annoying. Then there were like other things where like, I was really scared of like nuts. So I was scared <sighs> that I was, I was going to like go into anaphylactic shock if I ate a peanut. Do you? Or, do I you, do not have a nut allergy. <laughs> Wait, what? Isn't that crazy? What, you don't have a, how do you have? No, nope. you convince yourself that convince you've... yourself really it's ocd it's wow. like fear that like if i ate it like i was like going to develop what if i was going to develop anaphylaxis immediately wow and like in order to stay safe and stay alive i have to make sure i stay clear of nuts and so it was little things like that so then i just like but i was able to still function because i was like okay well i'm just not gonna eat nuts and then i'm gonna be fine but then it kind of started to spiral and get bigger and bigger and bigger and by my senior year, it was pretty bad. And then I had to leave for COVID. And so I went home for COVID, whatever. I was miserable, depressed, like awful. I've had like kind of a nice little cocktail of like depression, anxiety, OCD, and panic disorder and sort of my whole life. And then it got really, really bad in 2021 end of 2021 was really, really bad. And it got to the point where I, I literally, I was living alone and I could not be alone. So I had to sleep at a different friend's place every night. And it was like, I need, I, I was like, I need to go home. So I went home and I enrolled in this program at this, uh, it's called the McLean Institute, um, in Boston. And it was, it's like Harvard's teaching hospital and was absolutely amazing. And the best thing that I like have ever done for myself. Mm -hmm. And it was a 10 week hospitalization program, par a partial hospitalization program. So I was actually part of, because it was COVID, it had to be virtual. Either you were mm -hmm. fully residential or you were virtual. And I, they didn't have space in the fully residential program and it didn't seem necessary yet. So I did the virtual one, which was, I didn't think was going to be effective, but it was incredibly effective. And I took work off and I did that for 10 weeks. What did um, they do in the program? So we would do exposure therapy. So we would do uh, a bunch of different things. We would do like, like we would have like different groups about like self-compassion or like goals and motivation or like whatever, like intrusive thoughts group. And like we had different group sessions that we'd have to do. And then we would do a lot of exposure therapy. So like with the nuts example, I would like sit there with a therapist and like I would, she would be like, okay, you have to like eat nuts now. So I'd have to sit there and eat nuts. And I'd be like, well, what if I die? And she's like, you might, who knows? That's, it's not impossible. And you would have to. And so, cause with OCD, there's like seeking reassurance. So seeking reassurance would be like, I'm not going to die. Right. I'm not going to die if I eat those. But the problem is OCD just eats at that. Cause it's like, no, but you don't know you yeah. could like, what if you're the one case ever of someone de developing anaphylaxis after eating nuts for the hundredth millionth time in their life, like whatever. And so they, they would say to you like, yeah, you might, you might die right now. Like you might eat that peanut, go into crazy anaphylactic shock and not be able to breathe and not get to the hospital in time. Okay. But you also might not have that happen and you might be totally fine. So let's eat the peanut. And then you'd have to eat the peanut. It was crazy, but it works. So where are you now with it? I still, so after I came back, I kind of did like intensive, I did therapy twice a week. I did like a group therapy session. And then I slowly was able to taper down to just doing therapy once a week. Um, and so I do therapy once a week. I still have waves of it. So sometimes I'll like go through like a couple months where I'm like, like, I don't even know who OCD is. I don't know her, yeah. whatever. What's actually was really cool was with my therapist last week. We, she went through the, like the DSM five is like the module for psychiatrists for, or like psychologists to diagnose like different disorders. And she went through it and she's like, you don't qualify for OCD diagnosis. Wow. And I like started crying. I was like, that's insane because I had accepted by high school, I had accepted that like I had OCD, I was going to have OCD for my entire life and I was going to be affected by it for my entire life. And that was just like a, fa a matter of like who I am and my personality. And so for her to say like, you don't even qualify for it anymore was unbelievable. That's um, huge. It was really cool. Yeah. It was really, really cool. Well, I think cool. it's like, like a, what, what feels cool about that is you can just change yourself in any way you see fit. Like, yeah. like your mind is actually like, like 
be you can it's able to be like molded exactly by you and exactly and so uh, things that don't serve you anymore good riddance exactly if you want it to exactly and that's where like i think like program it's so upsetting to me that like programs like that are so looked down on or not like looked down on but seen as like oh like you went to a mental hospital like oh that's crazy like whatever therapy's fine but like a mental hospital that's crazy but in my mind i'm like why is it seen like that it is the most amazing thing that's ever happened in my life like couldn't have been better yeah so that was like so 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 special um and ever since then i've been really on this like mission of like normalizing mental health and normalizing mental health treatment for people because what's like pretty cool is at least in the last like five years that i've noticed probably longer uh even longer than that like the the trend towards things just being like mental health being way more yeah. accepted um, as something to be talked about is uh, like, like it's just like, it's amazing. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think something uh, also just like watching old movies too, where it's like, yeah. Oh, like, Oh, I can't, I can't go to a therapist. I'm not, I don't want to be seen as crazy. Like I, I, I was watching a line. Oh, it was, it was in breaking bad. Right. It was in I breaking bad. Breaking bad. And in the, this is like 2005, maybe is the first, first, uh, season. And one of the guys, he's a, um, a, a cop and he's like, oh no, I can't, I can't go to therapy. Like, like, you know, everyone would, would think that I was going crazy. I'd lose my job. Like they think I couldn't handle it. Like all wow. this shit. And I'm like, holy, like, like that. I mean, that's how a lot of people thought back then. And so it's cool. Like how, how much we've progressed and that it is a topic of a conversation and it is, it's like, it is destigmatized in a lot of ways and we can have conversations about it and not think that just because someone is experiencing, uh, uh, either like poor mental health or like some, some kind of, uh, uh, issue in this moment that they can't seek treatment or can't live a normal life or can't function in society. Like there's, yeah. there's, there's so many ways to, to deal with, uh, you know, your brain. Um, yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. No, completely agree. So yeah, that's sort of where my thing is. And mm. sometimes I have moments where it pops up and like, for example, I'm like nervous to move to New York cause I'm scared of the subway. Um, subway is so scary though. I know. Right. Oh, I'm like, Jesus. Bro, actually that's like, I don't know if that's OCD. No, that's like, like, bro, Bro, there, dude, <laughs> I, I was in New York for, for that episode and like my, my, one of my friends was like, yeah, there was a guy like selling crack out of like a, a, a little like plastic container. And then another dude just got stabbed right next to him on the subway. Not to feed oh, your subway. God. Yeah. Um, I'm scared that someone's going to push me. I'm scared too. Yeah. Dude, there's like, there's like subway pushers I out know. there. Yeah. Be careful. I know. What do I do? Uh, Uber bike. Oh, I have to take the subway. <laughs> nah, it'll it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's like also taking the subway while drunk with a bunch of friends is pretty pretty fun. It can be fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm with it now. Mm. I don't know. Well, what I always ask every single one of my guests this. I think it's a fun little question. What advice would you give to your 16 year old self? 16 so i was in high school oh uh okay i would probably say start a podcast sooner honestly <laughs> uh, like i feel like if i had started talking to people because like so much of being young is is experimentation and like trying to figure out like what you want to do and what your interests are and yeah. where your interests lie and so like you should be experimenting and absorbing as much knowledge as, as you can and as, and, and getting influences from as many people as you can. Um, and I think in starting, if you started, a, if I started a podcast at 16 and just started like asking people like that I was interested in talking to, um, if they want to chat and then learning from them, like, I feel like I would have developed those interests, uh, even sooner. Yeah. Um, and so I would, and, and like, I think also like a lot of people feel lost when, when they're, when they're that age, a lot of people still feel lost when they're yes. that age and, and continue to feel lost. Right. So, uh, I think what that also does is it gives you a little bit of perspective that like, 
these all these other people that have accomplished a ton of stuff like don't have it figured out either yeah um and that's kind of comforting in some ways where it's like you don't really have to have this feeling of like complete knowledge or or complete certainty like it's okay living with a little uncertainty and uh and i think that the best way to do that is just like talk to as many people as possible and learn from their life experience um because i think it can it can help shape your own path too so start a podcast fuck yeah <laughs> i love that okay amazing well cool. thank you so much sam thank this was awesome i'm on. so happy you yeah. came let me pick your brain of course very I love interesting. my brain being picked exactly <laughs> <laughs> fantastic oh, that was so sweet did you laugh i didn't